returns to the festival, and we've been very lucky to have had Michael Almereda at the festival with a number of projects, most recently Marjorie Prime in 2017. Tesla is also this year's recipient of the Alfred P. Sloan Feature Film Prize, provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Which is a jury award presented to an outstanding film focusing on science or technology as a theme. Tesla was awarded the prize for its bold and original approach to cinematic storytelling and for its beautifully sharp portrayal of a technological pioneer and visionary futurist who foresaw our age 100 years ago. And now to introduce the film, please help me welcome up the writer director, Michael Amoreda. <laughs> Avi Lerner for being brave and bold enough to finance this movie, and this amazing team at Millennium Media who followed through and made it a reality. It wasn't, wasn't easy, so I just a few people to thank. Uh, Jeffrey Greenstein, Krista Campbell, Lonnie Grobner. Um, I'm very lucky that we have their support. There's um, Every human being is an engine geared to the wheelwork of the universe. That's a quote from Nikola Tesla supplied to me from the Tesla scholar, Ethan Hawke. And um, I hadn't read that before. He, he, I thought I'd read everything, but he surprised me with that. And I'm not even exactly sure what it means. But I think it has something to do with Tesla's love of um, concentric circles and spheres and patterns and designs. And my mind moves back to 20 years ago, exactly 20 years, when Ethan and I had a movie called Hamlet premiere here. And uh, Ethan uh, was also here. And we, um, I find that a lot of what I have to say then, had to say then, is what I need to say now. And that is, the movie wouldn't exist without Ethan Hawke, his commitment, his trust, his talent. I feel the movie's as much his as mine. Um, as, as with Hamlet, we were working with lots of uh, restrictions and uh, good faith that we could get away with something. And I, I hope you can agree we did. But I want to caution you, this isn't the definitive Nikola Tesla story. This is just our take. The, um, the movie began, I should acknowledge that it's the first screenplay I ever wrote a long time ago. And it was optioned in 1983 <laughs> and not made into a movie. But someone else was going to direct it. And um, Rory Singer, who, who carried two other projects of mine into, into Sundance, um, asked what I have in the drawer. And he read this old script, this ancient script, and thought it might be time to tell Tesla's story. And I wanted to believe it, but I had to revise the script. So um, the, what you're about to see is influenced by a lot of literature that was written on Tesla since that time, but also movies by Derek Jarman, novels by, by um, Henry James, and certain episodes of Drunk History. <laughs> You'll recognize certain influences, some more conspicuous than others. But I also have to tell you that there are no electric cars in the movie. And there are space rockets, and if you are going to be bitterly disappointed, if you, you can leave now if you expect it. You can also, it's, it's, not, it's not really a conventional biopic of a neurotic mathematical genius either, so you can also run for the door if you're expecting that. There's, there's um, a lot, I, I know I have more people to thank, because I'm very lucky, in addition to Uri Singer and the team at Millennium, there are many indispensable people who for the movie. Um, producers Eisen Robbins and Karen Molina. <laughs> production designer Carl Sprague, his great grandfather is the inventor of the and himself. Carl's here. Um, uh, um, amazing uh, first AD, and Joan Bostwick is here. <laughs> Um, Catherine Schubert, the editor. The <laughs> superhuman costume designer, Sophia Messier. <laughs> the beautiful Greek name I can't quite pronounce, the line producer is here. Um, my friend and assistant, Ethan Nelson. Ryan Hawk, I have to thank very much. There's um, Doran Weber from the Sloan Foundation. It's incredible to have that kind of SF film, they're called now. They gave me a grant to develop the script in the residence in San Francisco. I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, but that's 
that's, um, I hope I hit most of the bases. And then I want to introduce the cast just to give you a taste of, the, I mean, that's the heart of the movie and I feel incredibly lucky that I was able to work with them and that they've shown up to support the film. I'll, I'll start with Rebecca Dayan. Everyone plays a historical figure that actually existed. Jim Gaffigan, you might have heard of him, he plays George <laughs> Westinghouse. Kyle <laughs> McLaughlin plays Thomas. <laughs> I should be ready for that question by now because this movie had such a long evolution it kept shifting and I think the main difference between the earlier drafts and the later current drafts had to do with introducing Anne Morgan's character and trying to understand Tesla on a more human level because I think when I was a teenager when I read about Tesla I was dazzled by something that seemed superhuman about it and without taking that away without without deducting how brilliant or almost inexplicably brilliant he was, I was also interested in what was human about him. So, um, so I hope that the movie shows how he ricocheted or affected, rico ricocheted off of or affected other people, that that became what interested me the most. And uh, Ethan, since Michael mentioned you were a Tesla scholar of sorts, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your research and your preparation for the role. He's joking. Um, uh, you know, for me, my father is a mathematician, and he, when I was younger, it seemed like the arts and the sciences were in such different universes. I felt so far away from the way my father thought. And as I've gotten older, and as you study science, there's you know, especially the great scientists, Tesla, Einstein, Edison, the great people, they see the universe like math, and it becomes kind of beautifully artistic. And it, I saw that, um, for the first time I saw that Michael dedicated the film in memory to Sam Shepard, and in a lot of ways, when you meet people that really think outside of the box, you can... Didn't, I need. I trusted Michael to do the research about Nikola Tesla. He'd been thinking about him so long. I did try to read what I could and get inspired by the things that inspire me so that I could relate to him. And there's this place where math kind of reaches philosophy and it intersects with it. That's really beautiful. And that's how I came to look at Tesla. Not as He has so many lives. You could make so many movies about him. He's so infinitely interesting. And each period has its own little movie that you can't as Michael said, you can't be the definitive one. He was such a unique soul. For Kyle, Eve, Jim, the rest of the cast, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your roles and what inspired you to be a part of the project, what appealed to you about Michael's vision. Um, Michael, really. I read the script and I met him and we liked each other. That was good enough for me. And there was Ethan involved and Jim and Kyle and I thought it was a pretty package, so I went with it. <laughs> Nice to be a pretty package. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think you know Michael and I and, and Ethan worked together 20 years ago on Hamlet, uh, which was here at the festival, and I had such a wonderful time with that film and uh, working with both of them. And I thought Michael's ideas were so different, um, and, and his expectations of me and the role of Claudius were so different. And I, and I, I would just really, really loved and so enjoyed working with Ethan, and we had some great scenes together, and I thought, oh, I want to do that again. So this was the opportunity that came along 
Yeah, you Thomas Edison. Okay, so why not? Um, so it was one of those, uh, and also I think when Ethan was saying the process of discovery, of reading about him and trying to find the man inside all the things that we think we know about him, uh, was so fascinating. And Michael, you know, he's such a scholar. He did so much of the work for us, I think, and presented it to us and made us think about certain things that maybe he hadn't thought about. And he presented me with some things to look at with Edison that were fascinating. I thought, oh, I think I began to understand uh, oh, I think I understood what was inside the man, so I tried to just access that a little bit. So that's it. This my, yeah, my, yeah. I do want to open it up to the audience in case there are any questions. Jim's got something to say. Jim? Yeah, certain. Oh, here, hold on, let me talk. Please. Ethan was holding onto the microphone. Does he want me to talk? You know, I, I had worked with Michael on the experimenter, and it's really exciting to work with uh, creative people that have thought about every single aspect of, of a project, you know, where there are endless conversations and there's an openness that really is exciting. And this was the first time I saw this. And you know what's interesting, and he's probably going to hate me saying this, is that, you know who Tesla reminded me of is Michael. <laughs> because... Michael is that independent voice who is perfect for indie films that doesn't get caught up in commerce or expectations. And, uh, and it is kind of infectious being around him. And I think that's why everyone's up here. I thought it embodied and reflected the way we're receiving history these days. I, I assume that I'm not alone in looking things up on Wikipedia before almost anything else. Or it just that, that everything's become kind of telescoped and simplified and we receive our, our sense of history is layered with all these, with received history. And a lot of it is really like drunk history. It's all speculation. A lot of it's speculation and rumor and guesswork. And a lot of it's actually not very accurate. And, um, and I wanted there to be a kind of ricochet or reverberation between that perception and, and the fact that we're talking about people who, who introduced this technology or were pioneers in leading up to it. And so it, as a kind of framework, this is, this is getting over, over intricate or <laughs> earnest, but it really did seem like a, a way to frame the movie that, made it, that would make it vivid and um, accessible. And, and the idea of Anne narrating from the future was meeting Tesla half, halfway. I, I thought of that, the experimental lab where she was talking from is it just a beautiful, and to me, almost a heartbreaking arena. Tesla built that lab. He occupied it for about a year. He never came back to Colorado. He never was able to verify or, or confirm the things he thought he discovered. And it, the, the laboratory was soon enough abandoned and the, the machinery was dismantled because he couldn't pay his bills. So that seemed like a, 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 a really um, poignant place to, to, to discuss the, the subject from. And I hope it has some mystery and some fun and just makes you think about how when we, when we talk about the past, we're also thinking about the future. Almost always there's, a, there's an interconnection. And uh, Ethan is actually better at speaking about this than I am. But um, I hope that's half of an answer, at least. Good one. How did you feel about playing historical figures versus fictional characters? What do you prefer? How, what, you know, how was that process for you? I think Hannah should answer something, so maybe I can pass the mic. I'm going to pass it to Jim Gaffigan. <laughs> All right, I've got 10 minutes on this. Uh, I, you know, I, look, I love acting. I love uh, portraying a historical figure. Um, and again, this goes back to Michael a little bit. He wanted these characters. I mean, we all know the Tesla and Edison story. We know about J.P. Morgan. We know that George Westinghouse is really good looking. We know all these things. But what I think Michael, in one of the first times I discussed this, 
uh, Westinghouse with him was not so much what Westinghouse did, but there's a humanity behind it. And I think that's also, I mean, these two were unbelievable uh, in reflecting the humanity of these historical figures. And uh, anyway, I'll give it to Eve. Um, hmm. You know, uh, people have asked me what my research was, and I always say I didn't really do any. Uh, because when I read the script, it, the character kind of popped out at me, and I felt like I knew exactly what I needed to do. Um, and I also think all of us didn't really have a literal interpretation of our characters. We all kind of put our own spin on it, like the film, you know, it's got a little twist to it. So. I, I agree with everything you really said. In fact, I, I'd like to hear some more from everybody. But um, no, I, I'm, I'm done. There's nothing interesting to offer. No, I thought it was interesting that we had a chance to jump in um, some of the scenes where said this actually never happened, which I thought was fun to be able to play with the what if, you know, of that potential relationship between Edison and Tesla, because there's a certain uh, desire, there's a yearning there. So, oh, if only they could have figured it out. They would have such, been such great teammates, I think, in that world, and that just didn't happen. That's the, the tragedy of it, I think. <laughs> it's just because I'm a really, really good singer, and I'm singing it on set, and Michael's like, you know, I really want to incorporate your interpretation of Tears for Fears, and it moves me a lot, and he was just really moved by my singing. And that's where he got the idea. Yeah. <laughs> right. This is Eric from com. If you want to support us, subscribe below. For more reviews, interviews, film festival coverage from Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, you want to check out these guys on this side. <laughs>